Together again after their journeys to Antarctica are Sir Edmund Hillary, who with Mr George Lowe will describe their trip south from Montevideo on the Theorem, and Lieutenant Commander Smith and Dr Trevor Hatherton, who will describe their work in McMurdo Sound. Most of this film was shot on 16mm by Sir Edmund himself. Our route from Montevideo was um, southeast down to South Georgia, and then we sailed down into the Weddell Sea, and uh, we had all our trouble down there getting caught in the ice, and back to the fords, but finally we made our way out and sailed down the Caird coast here to establish Shackleton. In Montevideo we'd been watching anxiously for some hours for the Theron to arrive, and it was a good moment when she anchored out in the harbour and we could go out in a small vessel to join her. We scrambled on board, and I remember well meeting my old friend George Lowe and all the other members of the expedition, which was all set to go south into the Weddell Sea on a preliminary uh, trip to establish a base for the Transantarctic crossing. The ship was heavily laden down with all forms of equipment, including aircraft, and she steamed out of Montevideo Harbour and started rolling southward towards the island of South Georgia. On the deck, you can see that very large crate containing a snowcat, and the aircraft was very heavily wrapped up against the bad sea and the weather. It was good to arrive in South Georgia and to sail into the calm of the little harbour at King Edward Point. Yes, it was very bad weather when we arrived, although we had heavy snow and the whale catchers were bringing in their whales into the whaling base. But we were at a small moorage underneath the mountains and we test flew our aircraft, a little Oster, uh, from South Georgia and made ourselves prepared for the ice which was ahead in the Weddell Sea. We were hoping to use the aircraft for reconnaissance. We left South Georgia, which is very mountainous and very attractive, and sailed from there out down into the South Atlantic. Then we rolled on south, keeping our eyes open to see our first glimpse of the ice. But none of us had seen the Georgian islands in any way, the Antarctic ice before, and it was quite a thrill to get amongst it. I think at first I was a bit disappointed with the Antarctic ice. It seemed so widely spaced and so easy. But later on we got into much heavier pack ice and things became much more difficult and interesting. It was about Christmas Day, I remember. We reached the pack ice and began butting our way into it. At first it was thin, as you see here, but later it became much thicker, several feet, two feet and three feet thick, and the ship uh, pushed in uh, with full force, smashing into the flows and the force of the bow, cutting its way in. I think it took a little getting used to the noise of the ice crashing against the ship's hull and the shudders as the ship hit very thick ice. But before long we became quite accustomed to it and it accepted it as part of the everyday life. Remember these two old penguins, Ed? The one looked as if it had an awful hangover. Slowly we forced our way southward, breaking through ice, most of the time two or three feet thick, but later on we were into ice that was up to 12 or 14 feet thick, and this was a, a tremendous task for our small ship to break through. The Theron was not an icebreaker, she's a sealer from Canada, but very heavily strengthened for ice, and she did a magnificent job. We used to charge the ice, to ride up on top of it, and the force and the weight of the bow used to smash the ice underneath. When we really became stuck, we used to try out the explosives to try and free the bow of the ship, and after a good deal of experience with this, we became very expert in moving it away. Meanwhile, on the other side of the continent, uh, three of our New Zealand observers were down in McMurdo Sound looking for a suitable base site. Some 2,000 miles away from the Theron's party, we made a journey round the bay ice of McMurdo Sound, some 95 miles long, and uh, looked at the various sites which had been recommended as suitable for the New Zealand base in 1957. You see, in spite of the fact that we're on McMeadow Sound itself, our progress with the boat sledges that we had was rather reminiscent of the Theron's journey through the pack. However, we weren't always in such uncomfortable conditions, and there were times when it was quite a pleasure to pull two sledges along in the glorious sunshine. Also with us, on the left-hand side, Bill Hartigan, who is an American photographer, and who, in fact, took these photographs on the way around. When we stopped at one particular camp, uh, we were able to have a good look at Scott's map at the same time and recognize the many points which had been so well mapped by him and his party in 1910. It really was remarkable how with what was almost mere sketching, they, they made a, a very accurate map indeed of the area. We could find no fault in it at all. 
A little later on, we made a further journey up the Ferrar Glacier, which you're look, looking at now. This was to see whether it was going to be possible to bring the track vehicles, which would be making the crossing across the Antarctic continent, down eventually into McMurdo Sound. It was not a particularly difficult uh, journey up the Ferrar Glacier. It only rises from a sea level to 5,000 feet high after a journey of some 60, 65 miles. So it's a sort of a slope of about one degree which you wouldn't ever notice while you were walking along. But although um, we sledged about 230 miles in this primitive manner, there were other forms of transport around the area as the Americans have established an air base in McMurdo Sound itself in order to take in their South Pole scientific station for the next year. And here you see us arriving at the end of this journey of some 95 miles around McMurdo Sound uh, to seek some relief and a cup of coffee and sleep at the plane. Well, we're back now again in the Weddell Sea trying to explode our way free from the ice. And after a terrific amount of work, both with the explosions and with getting over the side and working with pick and shovel, we did start to work our way steadily northwards, smashing the ice with the force of the ship and making sometimes a hundred yards, sometimes several miles a day. All of this progress took us actually 32 days, 32 days in the ice of smashing and dynamiting. We finally broke free and headed north actually, away from the main ice pack, turned east and then uh, had broken away from the west of it and made our way south. When we were getting towards the edge of the ice, we were met by a helicopter from Royal Navy Ship Protector, and the helicopter had come in to give us any assistance with finding our way through the, to the edge of the pack. It was jolly good to be out in open water again. As this long swell shows, we were getting near to the edge of the pack, near to the open sea. Turned uh, further east, then south, and then drove down through icebergs and a very light pack, really, and continued further south, heading for the Antarctic continent itself. I think the great big tabular icebergs are always most impressive to us. Some of them were many miles in length. In fact, I think they've seen them up to nearly 100 miles long. Then we reached the Antarctic continent, which here is it's this great shelf of ice sticking out over the sea, uh, and then with sea ice around the edge of it. And we wanted to find a landing site where we could get up the cliff and establish a base uh, for the coming year's work. Finally, we did find a base here at Shackleton and laid the ship alongside the, the bay ice and commenced the long and um, tedious business of unloading all the stores in the ship out onto the ice and dragging them up to our base site. We built a temporary ramp here for the personnel to walk up and down and then started the long business of unloading first our vehicles and then all of our gear and equipment. We had two types of vehicles, the weasel that you have seen and the Ferguson tractor, this type which we had with uh, the normal wheels, but we later fitted it with a half track and it worked much better in the snow, gave it more traction. And with this we shifted 350 tons of stores from the ship onto the ice and uh, about a half a mile inland. We found the most efficient method was unloading straight from the hold of the ship onto our sledges and then we'd uh, move the sledges away with our vehicles and the next vehicle and sledge would move into position. We had a very big dump indeed, about half a mile away, and here we unloaded all the equipment from the ship, and from here we moved it steadily up uh, the steep slope to the final Shackleton base site. Finally, after a week there, the uh, weather conditions were getting very bad, the ice was freezing up, so we had to leave. So after saying goodbye to the eight men who were staying behind there for the winter, the gangplank was pulled up and the ship drew away. And so the Theron leaves Shackleton. Through the long Antarctic winter, the eight-man party at the base will work in preparation for the return of the Commonwealth Transpolar Expedition next spring.